from Daily Trust News Center. This is the News Hour. Tonight on News Hour, Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi insists fuel subsidies, organized crime, says proceeds will be channeled to poverty eradication if elected. Court nullifies APC PDP senatorial primaries in Nasarawa and Kaduna states. And on the foreign scene, Kenya deploys hundreds of troops to regional force in eastern DRC. Hello and welcome to Trust News R. I'm Dashan Husseina Usman. And we'll begin with politics, where presidential candidate of Labour Party Peter Obi says he'll immediately discontinue the fuel subsidy regime if he becomes the country's leader, describing it as an organised crime which is only benefiting a few rich Nigerians. Peter Obi, who on Wednesday visits the headquarters of the Media Trust Group in Abuja, said the concept of subsidy right from records of consumption of fuel was steeped in corruption. The Labour Party's presidential candidate also speaks on other pressing issues. Yusuf Akogu reports. It appears that all the presidential candidates of the four leading political parties are in agreement that first subsidy must go. The question is how soon, considering that the present administration had set the exit date for subsidy for June next year, the month after it leaves office. For the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, exiting subsidy will be an immediate thing so that proper investment could be made in sectors that need to be invested in. Subsidy is organized crime. I will not allow any form of criminality as president of Nigeria. A, the amount of fuel they say we consume cannot be consumed by this country. There's an empirical evidence. We are about the same size as Pakistan. Pakistan, we are about 210, 220. Pakistan has about the same size. They have more roads. We probably have the same number of vehicles, or they have even more. Yet, their fuel consumption is the third of ours. So who is drinking the balance? Obi is also emphasizing that he is a Nigerian candidate and not a South Eastern candidate and will negotiate with all agitating groups around the country so as to quell the spate of insecurity across the country. I'm contesting as a Nigeria. I don't want people to vote for me because I'm an Igbo man, because I'm from Southeast. I don't want anybody to vote for me because people don't buy bread cheaper because they're from that zone. I don't want anybody to vote for me because I'm a Christian. I don't want them to vote because it's my turn. It's not inheritance. It is the turn of Nigerians to take back their country. A point of contention among Nigerians is the epileptic power sector which the Labour Party presidential candidate said will be tackled by drawing from models that have worked in other African countries. Egypt is just exporting electricity now to Europe. Egypt is a third world country. If Egypt can do it, Nigeria can do it. The Labour Party presidential candidate is insisting that Nigeria can be salvaged by purposeful and honest leadership that will manage the country's resources like he did in Anambra State and is boasting that he is the most qualified of all the contestants that have thrown their hearts into the ring. Yusuf Aku, Trust Television News, Abuja. APC presidential candidate Bola Ahmed Tinubu has asked party members in Lagos to put personal differences aside and form a united front to win the 2023 elections. Tinubu made the call at the stakeholders' meeting, which was held at the party secretariat in Lagos State. The report. Members of the APC in Lagos State turned out in large numbers at the party secretariat for a brief stakeholders' meeting, which chant and praises the party national leader and presidential candidate Bola Ahmed Tinubu was welcomed alongside the party's governorship candidate Babanjide Sawonlu and his running mate Obafemi Hamzat. We are in the race. The race to win is left. In your hands. It is left in your hands. The meeting takes stock of recent happenings within the party in the state and strategize ahead of the 2023 general elections. The legal state governor, Babajini Sawonlu, called on the party's faithful to deliver 5 million votes for Tinobu during the presidential election in 2023. For the past 22 years, 23 years, 
And he said, I'm a machine for our lap bar all five minutes. I was so lenny. He showed you one year. Lap bar all my shake. You are in your political domain. You have to go out and deliver. That is the major and important task. And this election, we are not talking about winning, but we are talking about turnout and massive vote. The meeting was attended by past and present leaders of the party and office holders. The party state chairman, Pastor Cornelius Ojelabi, was also present at the meeting. Still in politics, the vice presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Senator Kashim Shatima, has taken swipes at the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Atiku Abubakar, as well as Pita Obi of the Labour Party. The former Borno state governor who spoke at a town hall meeting between the presidential candidate of the APC, Bola Tinubu, and the business community in Lagos said Atiku is more of a Raila Odinga instead of an Abraham Lincoln of the United States of America. While describing Atiku as a political tourist, he said the former vice president will be retired politically in 2023. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I respect Atiku Abubakar, but leadership goes beyond unstatement-like rantings, someone who cannot unite his own party. I wonder how he's going to unite this nation. <laughs> leadership, Your Excellencies, goes beyond glamorizing poverty. No. We don't glamorize poverty. We fight poverty. I won't tell you that I have two pairs of shoes. I have a single watch. No. <laughs> Leadership goes beyond spewing dubious statistics or basking in a mediocre performance as the governor of Anambra State. A federal high court sitting in Kaduna State has nullified the primary election conducted by the People's Democratic Party for Kaduna senatorial, uh, Central Senatorial District due to irregularities. The court presided by Justice Muhammad Umar also ordered that a fresh primary be conducted by the party within 14 days. Justice Umar's ruling followed a suit filed by one of the senatorial aspirants, Ibrahim Usman, who challenged the May 24 primary that produced Lowell Adamu as the winner of the election on the grounds of overvoting. He also asked the court to order the conduct of a fresh election fresh primary election where all the six aspirants will test their popularity in a free and fair exercise. In his ruling on Wednesday, Justice Umar dismissed all the preliminary objections raised by the defendant and upheld all the reliefs brought by the plaintiff and ordered the fresh primary to be conducted by the PDP in Kaduna Central Senatorial District within 14 days. The Federal High Court Lafia has nullified the Nasarawa West APC senatorial primary election, which Shea Hutukur emerged as the winner. Reading the judgment, Justice Afolabi ordered the party to conduct fresh primary within 14 days. Abubakar Abdullahi sent in this report as presented from our studio. The Nasarawa State West APC senatorial primary election was conducted in June 4, 2022, and the contestants were Shea Hutukur and Labara Magaji. Tukur was declared winner after the primaries of which the other contestants, Labara Magaji, petitioned at the Federal High Court, Lafia, alleging that non-delegates from Kefi and Nasrallah local government were allowed to cast votes during the election. While nullifying the election, Justice Afolabi ordered for the conduct of fresh primary election, which should be participated by authentic delegates from the five local government of Karu, Kefi, Kokona, Nasarawa and Toto, which are within the senatorial district. Councils to the parties reacted to the judgment. We want a declaration that the number of votes who are disenfranchised, that is in exhibit D1, D2, should be removed from their, their, their vote so that the plaintiff will be declared the winner. Uh, either of the parties is free really here to say, oh, I want to appeal against the decision within 14 days. Uh, the candidate 
can appeal, the party can appeal, the plaintiff himself can say, I'm not satisfied. In a related development, the court also declared Mohammed Ibrahim al Kali as the authentic and lawful winner of the primaries of all Progressive Congress for Lafia North State Assembly constituency. al Kali challenged his substitution with Juliana Esler, and the court held that APC wrongly changed al Kali's name after he won the primaries. I'm one of the most happiest person today. Happy because the judgment went on the side of the commoner. I became so elated that justice gradually is becoming to take the front seat. It's a very landmark judgment, and particularly for those of us that we are in court. Uh, we saw it, and uh, we had the reading of the judgment from the beginning of it to the end. The Federal High Court Lafia is entertaining about 10 pre-election cases, and so far judgments have been declared on fourth. The Federal High Court has set up a special task force of judges to swiftly hear and determine all pre-election cases before it. This was disclosed in a circular issued on Wednesday by the Chief Judge of the Court, Justice John Tehemba Soho. According to the circular, the task force became necessary to designate a team of judges following the large volume following the large volume of pre-election suits that have flooded the court. The circular added that judges will have four weeks within which to dispose of the pre-election cases. Moving away from that story, renowned economics professor Pat Utomi is leading a group of concerned elites under the ages of big tent that have resolved to change Nigeria's political trajectory from what they call transactional politics that should changes the citizens to a more people-centered leadership. Trustee Vice Shafiu Suleiman reports that the group told the news conference in Abuja that it is out to spearhead a political movement that will rescue the country and return it to the people. The leader of the movement and professor of economics, Pat Utomi, says the coming together of the like minds was necessitated by the lopsidedness of existing political trajectory in the country in favor of the elites as against the collective interests of other Nigerians. It was clear to me at least that there was no way the PDP or the APC could bring Nigeria to progress. Because what it does is create transactions, trade-offs between powerful people who want to control power for state capture purposes. And the progress of the people, not deliberately, just somehow becomes the secondary. The, the kind of nepotism that that fires off is the reason why Nigeria is not run by competent people. Everywhere you go, second-rate people are in position mm. because of, ah, it's my turn, appoint me, we, we promised you that, we delivered this. Mm. And the consequence is that our country is at the bottom of every nation. And we decided we would sacrifice anything to change this for the sake of our children and their children. The group says it is inspired by the current wave of global power shift from dominant agents of state capture to a more people-oriented brands of politicians powered by the presence of social media platforms and progressive ideologies. NTL in Kaduna, when it was commissioned in 1960, had pre-sold its entire production for the next six months in Manchester. Within one month, that company had broken even. Nigeria was exporting manufactured goods in 1960 to the UK. And today, we don't produce any more in this country. Why they seek to deploy various strategies to raise awareness among the electorate to achieve the goal, there are, however, concerns on their ability to defy the polarization of the political space along ethnic and religious lines in addition to grappling with a deeply monetized electoral environment. Shapiro Suleiman, Trust TV News, Abuja. 
the leadership of the Labour Party and the campaign leader of for Peter Obi and Deti presidential bid in Imo State have harmonized all support groups for the purpose of a successful campaign that will eventually lead to victory for all candidates of the party in the forthcoming 2023 general election. Addressing group leaders who converged at the presidential campaign headquarters office for Obi Deti in Oweri, the leader of the campaign team, Martins Agbaso, said no one will be left out in the task ahead. He assured of total commitment of the party to the success of the door-to-door -door approach in the campaign, which he noted is geared towards total victory for the party. Other stalwarts of the party expressed optimism that their efforts, if put together, will yield the desired result. The essence of this gathering is to tell members of our party and all the support groups in the state that we are ready. This is the time to roll up our sleeves and come together and build a formidable party, a formidable campaign to help the party and other candidates win. I believe he's the one fit for this work. Okay? I believe that he's coming into the office as president with such a lot of issues that the economy has been going through. Still in politics, few months to the 2023 elections in Nigeria, political campaign posters are taking over available public space in the commercial city of Kano. Trust TV correspondent Idris Jibrin reports that some residents, however, suggest that politicians should employ result-oriented campaign rather than printing campaign posters. His report. Four months from now, Nigerians will head to the polls to elect their state and federal representatives. In the politically sensitive Kanu state, all entry and exit points, marketplaces and big roundabouts, posters of party candidates are everywhere, and voters are expecting the politicians to do more in fulfilling their campaign promises. The first thing is that there is the intention of using youth to win election and the consideration of constituency influence. Therefore, voters need to pay closer attention as to who they, would, they are supposed to vote. Although campaign posters are to communicate to voters on the intention and plans of candidates, they often help people to get to know about who is contesting for what. However, voters say it's not the posters that matters. While candidates have all came out looking for voters, however, what I would say is that we have made a mistake of not involving God in politics before now, believing that our candidate knows it all. But most people have now realized the previous mistakes and hoping that God will help us. Before now, we thought that the politicians will make things easier for us. Unfortunately, the reverse is the case. We vote in 2015, believing that Buhari will make things easy for us. But he didn't, as we expect. As campaign continues across many parts of the state, campaign posters carrying various messages that may evoke hopes seems to be increasing across the state. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kanu. 18 migrants found to be in possession of national voters' cards on, and other migratory documents have been repatriated to their countries of origin. Comptroller of the Oyo State Command of the Nigerian Immigration Service, Isa Dan Suleiman, made this known to newsmen in Ibadan, where he also warned that no migrant would be allowed to participate in the forthcoming general election. 
The immigration boss hinted that any individual caught facilitating the process of obtaining any vital document would face the full wrath of the law. Don Suleiman stated this in the aftermath of a sensitization and enlightenment exercise for leaders of various nationalities resident in the state. 18 migrants were found with our national voters' cards. The state migrants, having violated the laws of the land as enshrined in our extant in our constitution, in our extant law as amended in 2015, were instantly eased out, that is, repatriated back to their countries of origin. And when we do this, we don't just dump them and probably go back, no. They are always handed over to their identified families. In most cases, we were accompanied by personnel from their embassy or high country in Nigeria. For the sake of emphasis, I therefore state that no migrants, regardless of their status, should participate in the upcoming general elections at any stage, and any migrant court shall face the right of the law, full right of the law. The House of Representatives Public Accounts Committee has summoned the Minister of Finance, Budget Office and the Accountant General of the Federation over the 62 million Naira budget proposal for the Auditor General's Office. The summons came after the Auditor General of the Federation presented his agency's 2022 budget performance and the proposed 2023 budget before the House Public Accounts Committee on Wednesday in Abuja. The budget 2023 proposal, 2 billion 518 for that's total capital expenditure. Total proposed. Then the budget office is giving an envelope of uh, 62 million 701 529. With variance of about uh, two points. We don't know why. Still on House matters, the House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs on Wednesday declined to consider the budget proposals of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs over what it described as administrative infractions and non-adherence to the Appropriation Act. The lawmakers during the ministry's budget defense accused the minister of asking foreign missions not to comply with several communications sent by the House of Representatives. The lawmakers noted that the refusal by the missions and embassies to constitute their tender board and render an account of the administrative charges following the directives of the minister is against Section 10 of the Appropriation Act. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Geoffrey Onyema, in his response, denied the accusations by the lawmakers, adding that at no time did he issue directives to officials of the ministry, embassies and missions abroad to disregard the directive of the National Assembly. We have called the attention of the minister to this act, but he has continued to direct the missions not to obey this law in spite of receiving about four letters on the issue including the latest one of 6 September 2022. In addition to the above, Section 7 of the Appropriation Act 2022 as amended, captures in Ta'alia that the Minister of Finance shall ensure that funds appropriated under this act are released to the appropriate agencies and or organs of government as and when due, provided that no funds for any quarter of the fiscal year shall be deferred without prior waiver from the National Assembly. We have given the directives, uh, I've signed up on it, uh, that they can set up, uh, as, as you said, Mr. President uh, has assented to it, so we have no problems. We're not uh, flouting it uh, in any way, and I have certainly never sent or signed anything to any mission to tell them to disregard um, those, uh, 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 those requirements. 
The Inspector General of Police, Usman Baba, has directed the Commissioner of Police in Oshun State, Olale Faleye, to investigate the alleged assault on a woman inspector, Olorun Shogo Bamidele, by her divisional crime officer in Oshun State. The IGP's directive comes after a viral video showed Bamidele accusing her DCO of assault and blackmail. Bamidele in the video alleged that her senior colleague named Ajayi Matthew had approached her for an affair, but she refused as she was married. She alleged that Matthew, however, didn't accept her rejection as he blackmailed and assaulted her. In a statement made available to newsmen on Wednesday, four spokesperson Olumuiwa Dejobi said the police will await the report of the investigation from Oshun State Police Command before necessary actions are taken. Yeah. You're watching News Hour on Trust TV. Coming up after the break, why jungle justice is evil. Do stay with us. interest bank like no other that's because we do not just share in your success story but we also share your risk like it's ours and that's why we say at Taj Bank our only interest is you the FCT administration strongly joins its voice to condemn in its entirety the nefarious activities of killer code groups existing in our communities and schools which runs contrary to social norms and values, especially the wanton attacks and most times killings of innocent citizens and destabilizing public peace as well as destruction of property. This is why the FCT administration is appealing to parents, guardians, community and religious leaders to join the FCT authority to eradicate cultism and bullying out of our communities and schools, especially in the Federal Capital Territory. Anyone caught in this unwholesome, barbaric and uncivilized act will be dealt with in accordance with the law. The FCT administration under the leadership and watch of the Honorable Ministers will not allow cultism and bullying in the territory. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. There is danger looming everywhere, not only affecting us, affecting the whole country. Ni at least they na was a iri buhu go mana chingaba. Ruan bini oyazo ya mama ye na na lo dokuma yazo ya kara. Tawtai asara taraba tai asara. Most of the flood we are seeing is a fingerprint of climate change. We are having rainfall uncertainty. The real person that's supposed to know and avert its effect is left in the doom. Aku matalang abinci aja teraba aman Nigeria. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. If you're just joining us, you're watching News Hour on Trust TV. Here's a recap of some of our top stories. We told you that Labour Party presidential candidate Peter Obi insists fuel subsidies, organized crime, says proceeds will be channeled to poverty eradication if elected. We also told you that court nullifies APC, PDP senatorial primaries in Nasarawa and Kaduna states. 
Moving to other news, the chairman of the People's Democratic Party in Zamfara State, Ahmed Sani, is dead. The publicity secretary of the party in the state, Abba Bello, confirmed the death of the chairman to Trust TV in Gusau, the Zamfara State capital. He said Sani was attending a meeting with Ulama Consultative Forum when he started feeling uncomfortable and was rushed to a private hospital in Gusau, where he was confirmed dead. The PDP chairman died at the age of 60. The Federal Executive Council again turned its attention on the East-West Road, approving an upward adjustment of construction of sections 1 to 4 of the road from 246 billion naira now to 506 billion naira. Work on the affected sections of the road will be from Wari to Port Harcourt at Eket and Oron. In, it will include the Oron Eket bypass, which will cost the government 260 billion naira. The cabinet also on Wednesday approved the contract for the dualization and reconstruction of the Colonel Kwana Ganja Adeja Road at the sum of 94 billion naira. Kende Amudu reports. With President Mohamed Buhari away for two weeks of medicals, Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo is taking charge of this hybrid Federal Executive Council meeting. The road contracts approved are aimed at effecting repairs on damages on the East-West Road caused by the recent flooding. So the approval was for the uh, a variation order for the East-West Road project sections 1 to 4 from Wari to Portacot, Eket Oron, including Oron Eket Bypass, uh, in the sum of 260 billion, thereby increasing the total contract sum for the outstanding sections one to four of the east-west road projects from the sum of uh, formerly of 246 billion uh, now to 506 billion. There is also an approval of the award of contracts for urgent repairs and special general maintenance of a few roads nationwide. The Minister for Works and Housing also got approval uh, for the award of contract for the dualization and reconstruction of the Kano Kwana Ganja Adeja Road in Kano and Jigawa states, section 2, Kano to Sali. Um, this was approved uh, to the amount in the sum of 94 billion naira, inclusive of 7.5% uh, uh, VAT, with a completion period of 24 months. Meanwhile, the Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation was given the go-ahead to secure a partnership on the upgrade, equipping, operating and marketing of the Space Museum and Planetarium. The buildings meant for this project had been in place since 2018, but funds to put the necessary equipment in place have not been forthcoming. Of course, there will be the question about if the ministry, which had promised manufacturing of pencils as far back as 2019, have been able to meet up with this basic project. Uh, the update I can give you is that, yes, already pencils have been manufactured in that place, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, my colleague, the Minister of State, visited uh, about a month ago, and uh, the report he brought back, you know, he physically visited the place, and uh, the report is that, yes, the process of manufacturing of pencils is on as we speak. Also on Wednesday, the Minister of Agriculture gave assurances that adequate preparations had been put in place to ensure that there would be no shortage of food as a result of the recent flood. To tackle insecurity, the Minister unveiled plans to recruit additional agro-rangers who would provide some measure of security on farm lands. From State House Abuja, Kende Amudu, Trust TV News. A senior magistrate's court sitting at Uke Karu local government area of Nasarawa State has issued a bench warrant against Idris Mohammed for failing to appear in court on Monday. Mohammed, who is the current commissioner for works and rural development in the state, is standing trial for offenses bordering on criminal conspiracy, trespassing and mischief in a suit filed by Idris Aliubori. And, and, and one other. Mohammed and five others were accused of trespassing on the land of the complainants and causing mischief after intimidating the complainants. 
counsel for the complainant, N.E. Manuel, called for the revocation of the bail earlier granted to the commissioner and an arrest warrant issued against him. However, counsel for the defendants, G.O.E.D.U., opposed the application for the arrest. The presiding magistrate, Aisha Abdullahi, in her ruling, upheld the application of the complainant's counsel and ordered the immediate arrest of the commissioner, citing continued disobedience to the court as the reason for a decision. In crime, officers of the Oyo State Police Command have paraded some suspects for vandalizing and stealing a transformer and other electrical appliances. The police also paraded other suspects for illegal possession of firearms, vandalism and other crimes. Speaking at the command headquarters in Ibadan, Public Relations Officer Adewale Oshifeso assured residents of the command's unwavering commitment towards ensuring that the state remains inhabitable for criminals. The police image maker therefore called for more synergy with members of the public, stating that its recent successes were made possible through intelligence-led community policing strategies, which, according to him, led to the arrest of the suspects who would soon face the full wrath of the law. As the command lost some of its finest officers who paid the supreme price. Emboldened by this, the command's security architecture was restructured and remodified to inch on detailed stop and search activities, strategic intelligence sharing with relevant sister agencies, joint patrols across the metropolis and adjoining routes of 3 million naira, otherwise it will be kidnapped. Upon diligent investigations and technological-aided surveillance, uh, the following suspects said to have conspired to initiate the phone call was arrested. Hence, uh, the process was thwarted. We have here four of them. Uh, the, actual plan, the actual plan of sending is uh, at the rate of uh, 1 million five or 1 million 700. The gun, has this the gun for the person where they do on top of the station? So, and this man buy it for, uh, then they leave for Ikiri and they tell me, say, you want to buy the gun and I go there. On the way that they harass me, say, either I'm a soldier and I tell them, say, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm not a soldier and they carry me come here. The Akwaibom State Police Command says it has arrested one Ime Sonde Etukudo for killing his daughter and burying her in a shallow grave. Police Public Relations Officer Odiko McDon said Etukudo killed his 20-year-old daughter Ofombok Ime Sonde for holding his manhood. According to, a McDon, to McDon, the suspect and his daughter had a misunderstanding which led to a fight and resulted in the victim holding on to the manhood of her father. In a statement made available to journalists on Wednesday in Uyo, the PPRO explained that in response to the action of his daughter, Etukudo used a stick to hit the deceased's head, resulting in her death. The suspect was said to have been buried or buried the corpse in a shallow grave to cover his tracks, but the police have exhumed the body and preserved it for autopsy. Delta State Governor Ifanyi Okowa has said it would issue a white paper on the report of the Judicial Panel of Inquiry into the intra-communal conflict in Ereni Town, Ugeli North local government area of the state. The Commissioner for Works in Charge of Highways and Urban Roads, Noel Omodon, said this while speaking to journalists on some of the decisions reached at the State Executive Council meeting presided by the Deputy Governor Kingsley Otuaro at Government House Asaba. Omodon pointed out that the state exco had adopted recommendations put forward by the panel, adding that some adjustments were also made by the EXCO, even as he said the white paper would restore lasting peace in Ereni town. The road that we would have liked to, to uh, uh, construct, but we have met that that road was under, either that my awarded or that some work had been done there. So that has actually slowed down our, our response to it. I've tried to ask, now, not speaking for ESCO, as Commissioner for Works, I've tried to bring that road up. I've tried to, you know, uh, uh, talk about it. And we're still working on it, but we have not been successful. But as for my, um, Madonna College Phase 2, that road does not belong 
that challenges we've had in Ureni. And we have found out that so subsequently, or rather consequent on what has happened, some people were killed. Some people lost their lives um, in the conflict. So government, the, the White Department will be issued formally. But just to paraphrase, we, we, we have decided that a lot of a few, a new, few new things have to be done. For example, we need to establish a new police station there. The police unit there was not robust enough to tackle the conflict. Following the recent flood that has rendered many homeless in Delta State, displaced residents want the government to come to their aid. Nafisa Bello reports that politicians are taking turns to distribute relief materials to the flood victims, an action viewed by some as making political capital out of their plight. The report. While on tour of the affected areas in Ugeli North and South, two of the local government areas of Delta State, seriously affected by the disaster. Most houses were still submerged in flood water, though the flood is gradually receding. Speaking on their predicament, the displaced residents say it was a bitter experience. We are the displaced people. Water pushers come off our house, run from there to another place. So if you see the whole of Erin, water don't cover and finish. That's why they bring us come primary school here. And as it's yesterday, they bring us, relocate us to this place. No facilities done there. Now beg, now we they, we they beg. We they beg the federal government, we they beg our state government. Say, what thing don't start? Make it make and grow up so that we go feel benefits more before the water go dry when we they go back to us. The water have over covered my house. That is what made me to be here. Some affected residents of Otoewu, Olomu, and other communities who are taking refuge in Okparabe called on government at various levels for urgent provision of medical attention due to deterioration of health conditions owing to waterborne diseases, as well as provision of foods and non-food items in dealing with the aftermath of the situation. A concerned stakeholder, Efe Dafinoni, who made it to the relief center provided by a religious body, added his voice to this call. What happened here today, we are really we really appreciate what happened today. We want to say thank you that God will surely bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. And we still want to appeal because what really happened, it really affects us. Some of us now that we are living in this camp, we don't have home. Some of us, after we live here, we don't have place to stay. We still need more help to assist us in our place to stay. Most of us now, we go back, we need to do some renovation in our homes. So some of us, we still don't have crops, like what you said the other time. The bigger message here today is that the federal government, the state government, needs to come to the aid of these displaced people, not just to provide food for them, but also to look at how they will live tomorrow. Their homes are destroyed, their crops are destroyed, their means of livelihood are destroyed. That is the bigger message. We want help, real help, real long-term help to come to the displaced people. Aside the commercial quantity of crude oil and natural gas, Delta State is also known for palm oil production, cassava, yam, fishing and other farm products. But the devastating flood has affected all this. Nafisa Bellu, Trust TV News, Benin. Similarly, presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, the Deputy Senate President, Uvie Omoa Gege, and the APC governorship candidate in Delta State have donated relief materials to displaced flawed victims in the state. Addressing supporters on behalf of Tinubu and himself in Eforum, Delta State, Omoa Gege said the visit is to show solidarity, empathy and sympathy with those devastated by flood in some communities in Delta State. At Okwabe, where he led the APC train to visit the IDP camps, Omoa Gege expressed sympathy on behalf of Tinubu and himself and said the 200 million Naira donation was a heartfelt contribution by both of them to cushion the plight of the victims of the flood. While Tinubu announced a donation of 50 million Naira cash, Omoa Gege gave out 150 million Naira worth of relief materials.
Angry youths on Tuesday night set ablaze a suspected motorcycle thief in the Mado area of Tudungwada community of just north local government area of Plateau State. The suspect was lit up after he was beaten to death. The incident is coming barely two weeks after a suspect alleged to have stolen a motorcycle was also killed and set ablaze in the same area of Tudungwada. David Musa, a vigilante in the area who was present when the suspect was arrested, told Trust TV that the suspect was arrested when he was trying to run with the motorcycle. The Plateau State Police Command is yet to issue a statement on the matter. Residents of Mokurni in Benue State have described extrajudicial killings in the form of jungle justice as evil. This follows recent, a recent mob action in a community in the state capital which resulted in the killing of a suspect. The report. The residents, mostly youths, in the Benue State capital, Makudio said lack of trust in government agencies like the police to serve justice accounts for increased cases of jungle justice. They are, however, hopeful that something can be done to respect the rights of suspects. But the challenge we're facing concerning uh, jungle justice is in dual form. And the security are the major culprit in this. Because then very often, sometimes, one who has done something is caught. And the security crew will free that person to go. Now you see people moving about with bottled up reactions. But if everybody is um, not angry, we have uh, minimal tempers, we have people who are not out, outrightly to, 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 to react to what might have hit or to happen to them. If we see that anything that rises tempers, people will first of all calm down to establish the truth. The residents condemn the act and their citizens to find other ways of handling suspected criminals. They also said the area of jungle justice is over because civilization has provided many options. The jungle justice is met by people who have engaged in very, very petty things like stealing, snatching of phones and all that. And you see that the real criminals that have caused our society, the damage, the real damage are very, very untouchable. So for me, it's a no, no, no. And uh, if it was my power, I would do everything to avoid it, prevent it at every angle in existence. And I think the societies too should look at it and try to uh, move away from that act. If a person does a wrong thing, there are people who should take care of that. We have securities, security agencies who take care of those kinds of things. Call on the police and let them take care of the matter. Not uh, you taking laws into your hands. We have laws that are guiding our society and our country. So jungle justice is just like we are taking laws into our hands, which cannot bring any solution. We should condemn it totally. Uh, the security agents, agencies in our country should do more to make sure jungle justice has been stopped. Despite calls by civil society organizations and NGOs for human rights protection in communities, the cases of extrajudicial killings or jungle justice have continued to rise in recent times. You're still watching News Hour on Trust TV. More stories after the break.
Plus TV, documenting the Nigerian story. This is the road leading up to the Lokoja Bridge from Abuja. And as you can see, tankers carrying fuel, trucks carrying livestock, perishables and commuters trying to make their way from point A to point B have all been slowed down as a result of the flooding going on in Lokoja. As I tell you, so my, 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 my house is inside water like this. This is my house, this green zip is my house. We have no option than to come here and look for what we drop. This, this water has really spoiled many things. Even as I'm talking to you, I'm not in my own house. I want to um, encourage them and assure them that their government, their governor, the governor they elected had come to see them. And government officials have been going there to see them. They are not in this alone. We are with them. Welcome back. Let's now join Chia Maka Nwa for, for the business news. Nigeria's rail sector has recorded a decline of 125.6% in passenger movement in the second quarter of 2022. This is according to the National Bureau of Statistics Rail Transportation Data. According to the report, attacks on trains conveying passengers on rail infrastructure is identified as a major cause. According to the NBS, a total of 422,393 passengers travelled by train in quarter two of 2022, compared to 953,099 recorded in quarter one of the same year, a decline of 125.6%. The revenue generated from passengers decreased by 76.2% from 2.1 billion naira in the first quarter of 2022 to 500 million naira in quarter two, while with revenue generated from goods increased by 19.84% to 86.01 million naira. In 2021, 1.08 billion naira was generated from passengers in the second quarter, which is now less than half in 2022. And finally, in stocks, transactions on the floor of the Nigerian exchange on Wednesday closed on a positive note. The All Share Index rose by 1.01% to close at 44,283.02 points from the previous close of 43,839.08 points. The market capitalization appreciated by 1.17% to close at 24.120 trillion naira from the previous close of 23.840 trillion naira, gaining. 280 billion naira. The market broke close negative as nine equities appreciated in the share prices against 23 that declined. An aggregate of 155 million units of shares were traded in 3,796 deals valued at 1.5 billion naira. And that's it on Business News. I am Chiamaka Mwafo. All right, let's take a look at the international scene. Kenyan President William Ruto says his country is sending more than 900 military personnel to the Democratic Republic of Congo to join a new regional force tasked with trying to calm deadly tensions fueled by armed groups. Ruto on Wednesday called the mission necessary and urgent for regional security and said he and the DRC's president had agreed on how Kenyan forces would work with Congolese and other forces on disarming rebels and peacekeeping in the country's troubled east. 
The Kenyan forces will be based in Goma, Eastern DRC's largest city. The East African Community Regional Force, agreed upon by heads of state in June and led by a Kenyan commander, also has two battalions from Uganda, two from Burundi and one from South Sudan. We'll now join Ibrahim Yusuf for Sports News. The Nigerian national men's football team, the Super Eagles, will in the coming days play Costa Rica and Portugal in the last international matches for the year 2022. Aside from giving new manager Jose Pacero the chance to improve his current record in friendlies, which stands at zero wins in three friendly games under his watch, the matches will also give the opportunity for the new technical crew to call up new exciting players for the national team and also try out new tactics that will help rejuvenate the Eagles as they aim to get over the disappointment of not qualifying for this year's World Cup in Qatar. Head coach Jose Pacero says that the team aims to improve on their recent record in friendly matches when they file out against the Central Americans and the Europeans. The Super Eagles will play Costa Rica on the 10th of November, while the game against Portugal comes up on the 17th. Rivers United put one leg into the money-spinning group stage of the CAF Confederations Cup after a comprehensive 5-0 win against Al Nasser of Libya in the first leg playoff round tie. The Port Harcourt club, playing at home, dominated the game from start to finish. Experienced defender Ebibo Duru gave the home team the lead from the spot on 12 minutes, while Kezie Enyinyaya doubled Rivers United lead with a fine finish two minutes later. Ghanaian midfielder Paul Aqua added a third for Rivers a minute before the break to give the hosts a 3 0 halftime lead. Two more goals after the break from Duru and Malaki Ohawume completed the route. The second leg will hold at the Martyr Stadium in Benghazi on Wednesday, November 9th, with the winners proceeding to the group stage of the competition. And finally, in boxing, former heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua says he is prepared to fight all rival Dillian White on his return to action next year. 33-year-old Joshua is considering his potential next opponent after losing a rematch with Alexandra Usyk in August. Joshua, who beat Dillian White in 2015, says Swede Otto Wallin and Croat Filip Hergovic are also options. White and Joshua's rivalry has endured over the years, with both men repeatedly saying they are open to a rematch. White is also looking to bounce back from defeat by Tyson Fury on November 26th when he fights American Jermaine Franklin in London. Joshua is currently recovering from his third defeat and the first successive losses of his career and says he wants no easy bouts on his return. And that's sports news. I am Ibrahim Yusuf. And with that, we've come to the end of News Hour on Trust TV. Don't forget to follow us across all our social media platforms. I'm Dashan Husseina Usman. Thanks for watching.